Well, the man of God's going to come and he's going to speak to us. He pastors in Ranger, Georgia. Does anybody know where Ranger, Georgia is? Well, Ranger, Georgia, several of us do, not very many of us, but he pastors in Ranger, Georgia, an incredible, life-giving, wonderful church, reaching people. He has a school of ministry. He's reaching the, the addicts of his community as well, has an incredible uh, uh, deliverance program there for his, uh, for his community. Uh, I've known him for over 20 years and can say that he's one of my very best buddies on the planet. If I ever needed anything, I'd call him. If I just need a word of encouragement, I'd call him. If I just needed somebody to speak truth to me, I would call him. And he would always give me what God was laying upon his heart. I can't tell you how big of an honor it is for us today to have this man of God standing in front of us today to bring the word of God. So would you help me give an incredible Christ Fellowship welcome? Would you stand to your feet and welcome Pastor Lance Johnson to this platform? Praise him. Praise you, Jesus. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise in the house today, church. Come on, I mean the one that reached down in the miry clay and pulled you out. The one that loved you when nobody else would love you. The one who's made a way for you when you thought there was no way. The one who provided for you when you was broke, busted, and disgusted. The one who showed you mercy when you should have had judgment. Let's give Jesus some praise in the house today. He's worthy, church. He's worthy today. He's worthy of every shout. He's worthy of every clap today. He is the glorious Lamb of God. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him, amen? Everything I have, everything I do, everything that is in my life is because of who he is. Everything good is because of his faithfulness to us in this house today. So before I preach, let's just take a moment by our heads today. Father, without you, I'm simply nothing. Father, without you, I'm a drug addict, an alcoholic, a womanizer. Without you, I would stumble and fall today. But with you, Lord, I can do all things. But with you today, God, Father, this service can be different. With you, God, today, captives can be set free. God, broken hearts can be healed once and for all. That today, God, those who have been oppressed can be set at liberty today. Those who have walked under tremendous burdens, God. Those that have been weighed down by the troubles of life. Today, God, that yoke and that weight can be destroyed if your presence shows up in this place. Father, if it's just another sermon, God, will leave with lifeless words. But God, if your presence will show up in this place, God, you will transform lives. God, you will heal the broken today. God, cancer will flee. God, today, broken hearts will be healed. Lord, those bound by addictions will be liberated today, Father, and we will walk in the newness of life and resurrection power if you show up today. So, Father, we call upon the name that is above every name with hearts hungry and desperate for you. And God, we pray today, shake this place like a rag in your hand. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, church, one more time. Give God some praise. Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 6 this morning. I don't know about you, church, but... Uh, when I've tasted of the true presence and power of God, it's hard to go back to church as normal. Because see, when you have church as normal, people come in one way and leave the same way. When you have church as normal, people come, on and come in and put on their Sunday morning best. They walk in with happy faces, but when they get home behind the bedroom doors, there's depression, there's despair, there's struggles, there's addiction, there are problems that are unconquerable. That there's exhausted labors of resources to try to make it and to try to overcome, but at the end of the day, there's discouragement and disheartment. But I tell you today that if God shows up, I tell you today, if we do church that is not normal, 
that if we have God invade our lives, if we have God's presence invade our home, everything is going to be transformed. Everything is going to be changed. You will not leave this place the way you came in. You will not leave with the same problems, with the same addictions, with the same struggle. Your marriage will leave here healed today. Your body will leave here healed today. Your addiction will be gone and banished. Your broken heart today will be healed. You will see life from a different perspective if the presence and the power of God shows up. And guys, I don't want to have church as normal no more. I want to see people liberated. Guys, and it's not that we don't do good things and it's not that we don't have good church, but I'm telling you there's another dimension of what God does where the dead men get out of tombs, come on, where cancer is healed, where blind eyes are open, where deaf people hear, where those that have been bound by the incarcerating power of sin are liberated at a moment and an instant from a touch from the master. Second Samuel chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, bringing revival to the house of God. Guys, when I say revival, I'm not defining revival as something that we've experienced in the past, in the 90s. Not something that we went to a church and visited. But I'm talking about a revival where everything that we read, study, and understand about God is restored not only to the church, but it's restored to us as individuals of the church. That revival is stored to our families, our marriages, our home, our children's life. That our children are more sold out to Jesus than they are to be socially correct. That our children are so sold out to God that they will not be the ones that are influenced by peer pressure, but they will become the influencer of their generation. They will be the ones who transform social media. They will be the ones that make a mark and leave a mark on this culture and in this life. But guys, it's going to take a restoration and a revival of the presence and the power of God. We need more than a revival. Guys, we need an awakening. We need an outpouring of the power of God. I'm talking about the unadulterated, come on, the unrestrained power of a living God who raised a dead man out of a tomb four days dead. We need resurrection power in the church again because the God that we serve today is the same God that walked the earth here uh, 2,000 years ago. Guys, he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And we got to preach a living God who is a present help in a time of trouble, who is an answer to the dilemmas that we face. We need revival in the house of God. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, I'm just going to read a couple of verses for the sake of time, but I'm going to preach to you the entire chapter, if that would be okay. The Bible said, again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel. Everybody say, the chosen men of Israel. As a matter of fact, it was 30,000 men that he gathered together. And David arose and he went with all of the people that were with him to Baal of Judah and bring up from thence the ark of God whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a, everybody set with me, new cart, and brought it out of the house of Abinadab to the house of Gibri. And Uzzah and Aho, the son of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeth, and accompanied the ark of God. And Aho went before the ark, and David and all of the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments. Now with that said, verse 6 says, And when they came to, to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made such a breach upon Uzzah, and he called, upon, he called the name of the place Pierza to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. Everybody say David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto, uh, unto him into the city of David, but carried it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Guys, David had a kingdom, but he had a kingdom without an ark. See, the ark represents the presence of God. 
It was between the, between the cherubims that the manifest presence of God dwelled. And David had a kingdom. He was a king. He was fulfilling purpose. He was fulfilling the dream and the call and the mandate of God that was upon his life. He had walked upright before the Lord. He had done all that the Lord had asked him to do. He walked in integrity. He walked in character. He pleased the Lord in every way. But at the end of the day, the presence of God was missing from Jerusalem. How many of you know that we can walk in integrity? We can walk in purpose. We can walk in assignment. We can fulfill what God has created us to do with character and integrity and still be missing the presence of the Lord. And guys, I'm telling you, we can have church without the presence of God. We can have church without the manifestation of the power of God himself. If you don't believe it, look in the book of Revelation chapter 3. You will find a church there called Laodicea that was having church as usual. They were going through the motions. They were carrying on daily activities. They said, we have need of nothing. What's wrong with our ministry? What's wrong with our church? We're feeding the poor. We're taking care of the hungry, we're clothing the naked, we're reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but Jesus says the truth is you're poor, you're naked, and you're blind. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man would open that door, I will come into him and sup with him. They were having church without God. These were not heathens. They were not unbelievers. This is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ having church without the presence of God. And see, David understood something. I've got a king, but I've got to have the king's presence. Come on, I've got a kingdom, but we got to have the presence of the king in our kingdom. And he wasn't talking about his own presence. He was talking about the presence of God because he knew it was the presence of God that separated him from everybody else on the face of the planet. It was the presence of God that would make Jerusalem excel. It was the presence of God that the people would be blessed. It was the presence of God that lives would be changed. And David said, I can't have a kingdom without the presence of God. Guys, can I tell you something? We can have church without the presence, but people will leave the way they came. But if God's presence is here, lives will be changed. Marriages will be restored. That God would do what we could never do within our own ability. That God will move beyond the norm of church. That captives would be set free. That blind eyes would open. That the gospel would be heralded. That the efforts that we apply to evangelism and ministry would have an anointing on it that would draw the people and change lives. See, when God shows up, miracles start happening. That all of a sudden people start saying, who is this Jesus? Where is this Jesus? Because marriages are being restored. Lives are being changed. Addicts are being delivered. That lives are being transformed by a supernatural power. And God is doing in an instant what man could not do through years of preparation and counseling. The presence of God turns everything around. Moses understood the power of the manifestation of the presence of God. And when God told Moses, said, Moses, I'm going to give you the promised land. I'm going to give you prosperity. I'm going to give you wealth. I'm going to give you everything that I said I was going to give you because God is a man of character. God is a God of character that does what he says. He said, Moses, I'm going to give you the promised land, but I'm not going with you because the people are a stiff-necked people. And God said to Moses, God, if your presence don't go, then I'm not going. Because he understood that without the presence of God, the prosperity of God was no use to him. That it, without the presence of God, he would be like the rest of the people. And he replied to God, God, your presence is the only thing that makes us different from the rest of the world. And it's the presence of God that makes the church different than the rest of the world. It is the presence of God that causes the church to blaze the trail and set the example for the rest of the world. We are not to follow the world, church. We are to be the trailblazers for God himself. We're to be a nation changers. We're to be those that blaze the trail of moral values. We're to be the ones that, that set the stage for how our country should be. It should not be that the world is affecting the church, but it should be if we have the presence of God that the church is turning the world upside down.
Come on, we need a world-shaking church. We need a church that, that the community is not just, listen, that it's not quick to criticize, but it's fearful because the presence of God is with those people. And it's Mark. Jesus said by his own words, if you don't believe me for the words that I speak, believe me for the works that I do. Don't just believe me because my sermon's great. Don't just believe me because I am the living word. Don't just believe me because of what the scriptures say about me. But believe me for the works that I do. And then he said, the works that I do, greater shall you do because I go to the Father. His purpose for going to the Father was so that we could become that ark, my friends. We could become the habitation of God. See, it wasn't just to get you out of hell and get you into heaven. It was so that God could clean your vessel, that God himself would not have a visitation with you, but God could take up a habitation in you. That the purpose for the blood was so that the presence of God could live and abide in you and I. Come on, somebody. That the God who created the heavens and the earth, that the God who parted the Red Sea, that the God that said to Lazarus, come forth, that the God who opened the blinded eyes, that the God who healed Barnabas, that the God who was able to do the impossible is the God that lives in you, and he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Woo. Somebody say we need the presence of God. David, understand I can't have a king without, the, without the, the ark of God. I've got to have the ark here. It's not enough to have a kingdom, not enough to have the promises of God. I've got to have the ark of God. There's got to be more. He goes down to pick it up, and the Bible says he goes, he carries 30,000 men. Everybody say 30,000 men. 30,000 chosen men. And I need to tell you something. David failed in his effort to bring back the presence of God. Let me tell you something. It don't take 30,000 people to bring back the presence of God. We're more concerned about numbers than we are the presence of God. Guys, numbers is not going to get the presence of God back into the house of God. And sometimes we're moved emotionally by what we see numerically. But guys, let me assure you of one thing today. It's not numbers that's going to bring back the presence of God. We've got to be more concerned about God than we are numbers. We've got to be more concerned that if God shows up, because I want to tell you something. If God shows up in the house, people will climb on top of roofs and saw holes in the top of the roof to get into the presence of God. If the presence of God shows up, men will climb trees just to get a glimpse at what God's doing here. You won't be able to get them through the doors if the presence of God shows up in this house. See, you get them in the presence of God, they'll throng him from every side. They'll pull on him. They'll show up at every event. They'll follow him three days out into the wilderness without food and water just to hear him speak the word. You understand the presence of God changes everything. The presence of God will bring transformation. And transformation is what people are hungry for. Struggling marriages are in need of it. Broken people are in need of wholeness and healing. Those that have struggled, those that are dysfunctional, God takes the broken and makes it whole. God takes the dysfunctional and makes it functional. That's what the presence of God does for people's lives. Some of you that are weary, can I prophesy to you this morning? Some of you that are weary and heavy laden, some of you that's been fighting the good fight of faith and you're wore out and you're tired and you're struggling even though you love God with every fiber of who you are but you seem like it's a battle just to get up every day and try to fight through all of the challenges and difficulties you got going on in your life. My Bible says that in the presence of the Lord there is a time of refreshing. You want to be renewed today. You want that strength back. You want that vision back. You want that fire back. Get in the presence of God. Somebody say, I need the presence of God. So the Bible says that he takes 30,000 men down. And the Bible says that he gets a new cart. Everybody say, a new cart. See, the problem with that new cart is, is that's the way that the Philistines handled the ark. That's the way the world handled the ark. You've got to understand, so we're going to have the presence of God in the church. We can't do things the way the world does it. 
We may think there's a better way. There's a new idea. Let's follow this pattern. Let's go after that idea. Let's do what we got out of this conference. Let's do it this way. But guys, I want to tell you something. Just because it worked in corporate America don't mean it's going to work in the house of God when it relates to the presence of God. Guys, I believe in structure. I believe in organization. But guys, we can get so following the patterns of this world and guys, I'll tell this little story real quick and I'll get back to the word. But there was a day in Pastor Todd and I's life that we experienced the manifestation of the glory of God. And God took a country boy from the backwoods of Hickory Flat, Georgia. Didn't know us multiplication tables. Never spent a day in seminary. Transformed and broke a $250 a day cocaine addiction in my life. Took me out of the strip clubs and broke the bondages of alcoholism off of my life. That was 30 years ago. He put an anointing on my life and stuck me in a basement in the middle of the woods. And had me start preaching and putting up tents in crack communities. Because back then, crack was the epidemic. It wasn't meth, it wasn't heroin. Back then, it was crack was the epidemic. Cocaine was the epidemic. And I would go to every crack community and I'd preach what Jesus would do for you. That just like he set this old fat country boy free, he'll set you free too. He'll heal your marriage. He'll restore your family. He'll provide for you. He'll make a way where there seemeth not to be a way. He'll take all of that mess you made, give you character, give you integrity because that's what the power of being born again will do for you. And out of that came the waves of God and the glory of God. And out of that birthed a ministry that came out of nowhere in a city that had a population of 725. And, and that church, when I left there, had an attendance of 1,100 people. Can I preach in here today? You see, you got to understand something, that God will take nothing and make something. And the glory of God set in. I didn't know how to have church. I didn't know nothing about Robert's rule of order. They kicked me out of the Baptist church because I couldn't conduct a, 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 and moderate a, 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 a business meeting. Not being rude, I'm just telling you the truth. I couldn't, I couldn't get somebody to join the church. I started in a basement preaching and the glory of God showed up. And the presence of God would fill that little basement and then we had to move into a double wide trailer and the glory of God would fill that place and the power of God. And people were coming from everywhere. I don't know how they found out. Don't know how they knew about it. They started coming. I'd get in the pulpit to preach the gospel and never say a word. And the power of God would hit that little trailer. And people would fall out in the floor. People would get saved. And I never said a word. Marriages were being healed Drug addicts were being set free. They were coming from everywhere. Prostitutes, homosexuals, they were coming from everywhere getting saved and we knew nothing about revival. And God continued to move day after day after day and the church grew and exploded and then come television then people started seeing what God was doing and then all of a sudden the glory of God would be so powerful and I served, I told Pastor Todd this morning, that they were literally times that the glory of God would be so thick in the house of God that we couldn't even see the television lights glaring down through the glory and the fog. But today we got to have fog machines to try to create an atmosphere of what God does supernaturally. Guys, we need the presence of God because light shows won't change life, but the light of God will transform hearts. God will heal that marriage. God will restore that family. God will bring that wayward son strung out back home to you. He'll get him out of the jail and put him back in the safety of your home. God will take care of that addiction in your life, that secret sin you've got that you can't conquer. God will annihilate it by the power of his presence. But we can't do this thing the way the world does it. We've got to do it the way God said does it. And here's the reason why. Because as soon as they got to Nacon's threshing floor, see, everything looks good till trouble comes. 
Yeah, every church is great till your world unravels, till stuff gets shaky. Because see, church without the presence of God is nothing but a social club. Church without the presence of God is nothing but a place to fellowship together. There may be power in friendships and power in helping one another, but you don't need just what another person can contribute to your life because I doubt that's going to fix your marriage. If it did, then the three years you went to counseling would have fixed it. Oh, y'all forget I'm a pastor too. You see, because I understand something God can do in two minutes in an altar, what a year of going to a psychologist can't do. He'll do in one step. What we'll spend 20 years in 12 steps, and I love those programs, guys. I have them in my church as well as anybody else, but the truth of the matter is, is we need more. You need more. Your family needs more. Your children need more. I need more. Pastors need more. Evangelists need more. Apostles need more. We need more in the house of God today. And the Bible says that he goes down and the, the, he hits the threshing floor and the cart because of the oxen begins to shake. And Uzzah in an attempt to fix the instability raises his hand to stabilize the ark and instantly God kills us. Look at me, church. Without the presence of God or trying to bring in the presence of God in another way other than the way God has ordered it will result in the death of people. People are dying every day. They're going to church every day, but going home and dying spiritually. They're coming to church, but going home and their marriages are dying. They're coming to church and going home and their children are dying in illicit relationship by peer pressure, by the things that they're dealing with in our culture. And you know how we deal with that? We deal with it by saying, well, you know, everybody's going through it and, well, every generation's had it. Well, guys, let me tell you something. There is a power greater than peer pressure. There is a power that's greater than this world. (laughs) The presence of God changes everything. Guys, I'm tired of seeing people every day dying from heroin overdoses. I'm tired of seeing people dying spiritually. Their marriage is dying. Divorces are plaguing the church as much as they plague the world. And the church has accepted it as normal methods of life. Guys, we don't have to accept that. We don't have to accept being like the world. I may be in the world, but I am not of the world. I serve a greater king that is bigger than America's economy. It's bigger than the political system of our nation. I serve a God that if he is for me, nobody can be against me. I serve a God bigger than the increasing insurance rates. I serve a God that is bigger than a Democrat or a Republican. I serve a God that's greater than the power of heroin. I serve a God that's greater than the power of alcohol. I serve a God that's greater than the power of marijuana. I serve a God that's greater than the power of homosexuality. I serve a God that's greater than the power of adultery. I serve a God that's greater than the influence of fornication. I serve a God that's greater than the power of bitterness and unforgiveness. I serve a God that's greater than every sin that incarcerates us. I don't have to accept it. I don't have to say this is life. God needs somebody that gets unsettled that said I can't have a kingdom without the presence of God. I can't have a church without the manifestation of the glory of God. Guys, there was a day that we couldn't build buildings fast enough to house the people. We never ran a newspaper ad. We never marketed. It's just that God showed up. And people came from everywhere. They came from every walk of life. Rich, poor, 
bikers, prostitutes, you name it. They were coming from every direction, from every social culture, and they were coming. And many of them would get so offended in the service because the praise was so radical and the worship was so extravagant and the glory of God was so strong that many of them would get up to run out of the building but never make it to the door before they found themselves prostrate in the floor giving their hearts to Jesus. And guys, today we struggle to beg people to come to church. We struggle to beg them to come and visit with us. And we do games and gimmicks and promotion to try to get them there. Guys, all we need is the presence of God to show up that can heal them, restore them, and give them life. David said, I can't have church, no kingdom anymore. I gotta have the presence of God. Us a dies, David's offended. How I many even know God's bigger than an offense? <laughs> I'm gonna say it again, David's bigger than an offense. But let me tell you what got David over his offense is the fact that they came and gave him a report. David, you left that ark at Obed-Edom's house. You left it over there with Obed-Edom and everything in his house is blessed. Everything in the house is blessed. Everything around him is blessed. Guys, we need everything around us to be blessed. We need everything we touch to prosper. We need everywhere we tread our feet to be ours. We need the church to be able to, to radiate with the blessings and the favor of God that people know that we're more than in just an institution that gathers at a certain time on Sunday mornings. We're more than just an institution that feeds a few hungry people. And I'm not saying that's wrong, guys. We feed them too. We go to missions too. We do it all. But I come to tell you, I know there's more. And I believe that every God-fearing, God-loving man and woman in this room, in the sound of my voice, watch it on social media, however you're watching, you know in your heart there's more than this. There's more than where I am. And until you can recognize there's more, you will stay where you are. But we got to recognize this is not all there is. There's got to be a tenacity and a hunger that said, I won't play kingdom anymore without the presence of the king himself. Woo! There come a tenacity in David that said, I'm going back to Hobbit Edom's house. I got to have the presence of the Lord. And this is my closing point. When he got down to Obed-Edom's house, this time he went back to bring the ark the way God said bring the ark. See, God never intended for the presence to be brought back to the house of God through the methods of the world. There's no easy way to get the presence of God back in the house of God. See, we want it where there's no sacrifice. We want it where there's no offerings. Why do you think that the seeker-sensitive movement is so popular in our culture today? Because it requires no sacrifice. It requires no offering. It is not offensive. But I'm telling you, there is a bloody cross that is offensive to the world. There is a sacrifice that is offensive to the world because Jesus didn't give something. Jesus gave everything. That's why the Bible called him a rock of offense. God said, if you're going to follow me, it'll cost you everything. If you follow me, you will have to lay down your own life or you cannot be my disciple. You can rewrite it all you want to, but at the end of the day, Jesus didn't ask you to come to an altar and pray a prayer. Jesus asked you to forsake everything and follow him. And Jesus said, anything in your life that's more important than your commitment to following me, you better get rid of it before you make that prayer. A rich man came to him and said, Lord, I want to be saved. What must I do? He said, keep my commandments. He said, I've been religious all my life. I've kept the commandments since I was a little boy. That'd be like us in our day and era. We'd say, well, don't you know I've been a Pentecostal since I was three Been going to church and ain't smoked cigarettes and drank beer in 32 years. What must I do? 
Jesus said, uh, there's one thing you need to do. Go sell everything you got. Give it to the poor and then follow me. And the Bible said he left with his head hung low. Because, see, he wanted Jesus, but he didn't want him enough to lay down what would prohibit him from giving him everything. Because, see, to follow Jesus, that don't mean to visit him on Sunday mornings. That means that you are sold out on Monday as you are on Sunday. That means that you live for him with the greatest passion on Tuesday that you did on Sunday. That means that your worship and your dance that you do is as great on Wednesday as it was on Sunday. That means that Christianity is not what I am on Sunday morning, but it is who I am 24 hours a day, 365 days a year until I see the coming of the glory of my King. I'm not a part-time Christian. I follow him with the same intensity every day because I'm not following just the instructions of a pastor. I'm following the instruction of the chief pastor. I hear his voice, and I'm led by his spirit. Woo. See, Jesus asked you to follow him. The problem was they couldn't get the ark back to, the, to, the, to, the, to Jerusalem unless it was carried on the shoulders of the priest. See, here's the problem with the interpretation of that scripture. Pastor Todd... Pastor Karen, pastoral staff, get the presence of God in this church. But see, they're not the priesthood. We're all the priesthood. We're all, yes, we're all a nation of kings and priests. They're pastors with the gift, but we are all, the Bible said, kings and priests. The Bible said we're a royal priesthood and a holy nation. The Bible says we are a nation of kings and priests. So how are we going to get the presence of God in our house today? We're going to carry it in on our own shoulders. I want to preach in here today. You say, Pastor, what does that look like? Let me tell you what it looks like. You want the presence of God in your life? then there's going to have to be a sacrifice on the altar. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Every time that you find an acceptable sacrifice on an altar, you will find the fire of God. The Bible said God is a consuming fire. In other words, God himself said, one of my attributes is fire. One of my attributes, one of the essence of who I am is light. One of the essence of who he is is love. And where the presence of God is, there'll be fire. Where the presence of God is, there'll be light. Where the presence of God is, there'll be love. They are attributes of the very character and essence of who God is. Now watch this. Where there was an acceptable sacrifice on the altar, fire would fall. The greatest illustration that you will find of that is the altar in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. Why acceptable? See, we want to bring what we feel is acceptable. God said, I don't want what you think is acceptable. I want what I say is acceptable, and I don't accept 99.9%. God wants it all. You see, the reason that people come to the altar and leave the way they came is because they never gave God all. See, you want God to get you out of that mess you're in, but you don't want to give God your life. That means you don't want to give God whatever that stronghold is in your life, whatever that fleshly pleasure is. But see, if you will give it to God, God will consume it. See, you don't have to change yourself. You don't have to do that. You just have to make yourself available to God, and the power of God will do the rest. When they put that ark on the shoulders of the priesthood, 
they marched so many steps and they stopped. They put a burnt offering before God and they praised God. The Bible said God inhabits the... You see, you want the presence of God, then you're going to have to learn how to praise him. I'm going to say it again. You want God, you're going to have to learn how to praise him. That don't mean that I'm moved by my favorite song. That just don't mean that they sang a song that I can relate to. That means that my praise is not based on who's singing or what they're singing, but my praise is based on who he is because you can sing Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall, but my praise will not change. My praise is because of who he is. My praise is because he woke me up this morning. My praise is because he set me free. My praise is because he healed my marriage. My praise is because he's good all the time. My praise is because he loved me when nobody else would love me. Woo! My love for him is because he sought me when I was lost and didn't know where to turn. My love for him and my praise for him is because he never gave up on me when mama gave up on me, when daddy gave up on me, when my wife gave up on me, when the church gave up on me. God never gave up. My praise is not because I go to a great church. My praise it's because of who he is. Whew. And see, it don't matter what you say, I can get my dance on. See, it don't matter what you say, I can get my worship on. See, I can worship in the car just as good as I can worship in the church. Come on, I need to preach in here today. I can worship in the shower just as good as I can worship in a sanctuary with a perfect atmosphere. Woo! See, I'm probably the worst singer in this building but I can worship to my own praise. I'm gonna say it again, I can worship to my own singing. I don't have to have somebody that can sing it just right, be on key at every moment. I'm praising because of who he is. Woo! <laughs> you want the presence of God? Then go after God. He said, if you seek me, you'll find me. You ask, you'll receive. We got to have an attitude like a persistent widow. When they said, I'm not going to get up, I'm not going to get up out of my bed, I'm not coming down there to give you that, I don't have the time, don't you know me and my kids are in the bed? But she wouldn't quit knocking. God needs some people that won't quit knocking. God needs some Zacchaeuses that will climb a tree. God needs some women with an issue of blood that said, I'm going to push through the crowd. I'm going to do whatever is necessary. I'm going to touch the hem of his garment. I will not be discouraged. I will not be deterred. And I will not give up. I'm going to pray till God shows up. I'm going to fast till a miracle manifests. And when the miracle happens, I'm going to fast some more. When God shows up in the service next week, I'm going to keep praying the next week so he keeps showing up. Woo. David went into Jerusalem with that ark. And let's see, I don't, I don't know that he ever saw the manifestation. I got to give an altar call. I don't know if he ever saw the manifestation, but I believe he knew what was coming. I don't know if he ever saw the miracles, but I think he knew what was coming. And because he knew what was coming, it put a dance inside of him that was crazy. You see, because when you really understand what God will do for you, it'll make you dance like a wild man. It'll make you dance so much that your neighbor gets real uncomfortable. That maybe even your wife looks at you with detest in your eyes. Like, have you lost your mind? See, David come dancing into Jerusalem with such a mighty dance. He was down to his linen ephod. And he come dancing so mightily, twisted and twirling. And his old wife out there looking through the window. Oh, religious Saul's daughter. See, when God shows up, it'll put something in you that'll make religious people extremely uncomfortable. And see, if you're not willing to be uncomfortable... If you're not willing to become the source of somebody's gossip, don't follow Jesus. 
Because if God shows up, I promise you it's going to be controversial. If Jesus shows up and dead people start getting out of graves, it's going to be controversial. You start seeing something happen like Jesus spitting on a man's tongue and a dumb man talking, it's going to get controversial. Well, let me try to diagnose that theologically. Let me try to make some sense why Jesus spit in the dirt and made a mud pie and wiped it in a man's eye. Let's try to theologically dissect why he told the man to go dip in the water. And when he came back after he dipped in the water, you see religious people are always going to be uncomfortable with the manifestation of the supernatural power of God. Woo! Because let me tell you something, when God shows up, you ain't the star anymore. When God shows up, ain't no superstar preachers. When God shows up, ain't no big churches and little churches. When God shows up, lives get changed. And Jesus is the star. And Jesus is glorified. And Jesus is honored. And it takes the light off man. And it puts it on God. The question is, are you willing to get out of the driver's seat and let God drive? Are you willing to move over and say, God, I'm coming after you. It may cost me everything, but I'm coming after you. I don't care if my church is big. I just want you. I don't care if people like me. I just want you. I don't care if what people feel about me. I just want you. They may think I'm crazy, but I want you. You see, John the Baptist got Jesus, but they said he was a wild man in the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey. I just want Jesus. I just want him. They may hang you on a cross upside down. I just want Jesus. They may cut your head off. I just want Jesus. They may gossip about you. I just want Jesus. They may say you're the off scourge of the earth. I just want Jesus. And see, if you want Jesus, that means you show up for prayer meetings. Oh, I'm going to say it again. If you want Jesus, you'll show up for a prayer meeting. See, when people get serious about wanting Jesus, they'll show up for the things that attract God, not just the things that appear to be God. Because, see, we come to church and look what we think appears to be God, but then the greatest thing that creates the move of God is our prayer time. Guys, when the early church got together and prayed, prison cells opened. Y'all need to hear me preach today. Captives got set free. People fell on sword. When, when, when the early church prayed, miracles began to happen. See, I just come to ask the good folks at Christ Church in Dawsonville, how many of you are hungry for Jesus? How many of you want him more than the air you breathe? How many of you are so hungry to say, God, I'm coming after you with everything that is in me. I'm going to knock until you answer. I'm going to seek until I find. I'm going to ask until I receive. I am not going to just get me a sprinkle, baby. I want God to snatch me up and submerge me in the presence of a living God. Come on, church, stand with me all over the house today. God wants to send revival to this house. God wants to send an awakening somewhere in America. Why not Dawsonville, Georgia? Why not right here in the heart of Dawsonville? They already coming to visit your malls. How about they come visit the house of God because the presence of God is abiding in the house. That the parking lots of this place are greater and larger than the parking lots of the outlet mall. That you got more people waiting in line than they got waiting in line at your finest steakhouses. How about because if they know if they walk in the doors, their marriages are going to be healed. If they walk in the doors, their families are going to be restored. If they can get their babies through the doors, they'll get set free from the addictions in their life. That God will heal that broken marriage that adultery is tied to annihilate. That God will heal that broken heart that you get up every day wounded because most of your life you were molested and abused and abandoned and you're scarred deep and you love Jesus but you're broke. 
You love Jesus, but you know there's still things dysfunctional in your life. Listen to me, Jesus didn't endure the stripes he endured so that you could live with the effects of what somebody did to you. God did not endure those stripes for you to be a victim. He endured those stripes for you to be victorious and an overcomer. God don't want us propping people up. He wants us giving them what he accomplished through the death and the resurrection. And for that to happen, we gotta have the presence of God. I don't know how many people in this place is hungry for the presence of God, but I got news for you. This fat preacher from Ranger, Georgia, is so hungry for the presence of God. I have drawn my lines and I have decreed and declared, I will not do this anymore without his presence. I didn't come into these doors today hoping he would show up. I came into these doors because I believe it was a divine appointment of God and I'm expecting him show up I'm expecting for testimonies to come out of this service that's going to rock Dawson County it's going to rock this place it's going to spread through the schools it's going to spread through your employment places of employment that word's going to spread Jesus is in the house they're going to bring the crippled the wounded the outcast and the rejects and they're going to be healed and lives are going to be changed and the name of Jesus will be exalted that the people of Dawsonville understand Jesus is not just a way he is the way the truth and the life I want every man and woman in this room that's hungry for God today every man and woman that this message caused your baby to leap See, because I believe when the prophetic words in the house of God, that, 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 that gift of God, the God man inside of you will begin to leap. It'll cause your baby to leap when the word of God comes in. And some of your babies have leaped today. You felt something rise on the inside of you. That's who I'm preaching to today. Everybody ain't felt it, but I promise you there's many that have. I want every man and woman in this place today that your baby leaped. I want you to join me in this altar today. Every man and woman that this message is speaking to your heart. Every man and woman that's hungry today. You can come and stand. You can come and kneel. I don't want you to expect something from me today. I want you to expect something from God today. You don't need me today. You need what God is going to give you today. You need the presence and the outpouring of the master today. Didn't come to seek the hands of a preacher. I come to seek the face of my master. I come to seek your presence, God. Father, I'm dying without you. I can't go through the motions anymore. I can't do church anymore. I need you, Lord. I'm desperate for you, Lord. I'm desperate for your presence, Lord. I'm thirsty with the thirst that can't be quenched by this world. I've tried the world and the world didn't satisfy. I've tried the things of this world and they didn't work. I tried those relationships and they didn't fulfill me. I tried wealth and wealth wouldn't satisfy me. God, I tried everything and it wouldn't fulfill me. But today, God, I hunger for you. I thirst for you. I'm coming after you, Lord. I will seek you till I find you. I will pursue you till I am filled. Not just today, but tomorrow, the next day. The day after. So many times we have pursued God and then a little glimpse of the glory shows up and we back off. Do you understand this can't be what we do today at this service on this February day, this Sunday morning. This has to be what we do every day. You got to get up and go after him in the morning just like you just got done hearing the pastor preach. You got to have a tenacity to go after him at, at your lunch break. Sometimes you just got to turn off Facebook 
and open your Bible and say, God, it's more important that I know what you say than what Sister Sally said. Today, it's, it's not the news feed that I'm after. It's the heaven's feed. And God, I need a word from heaven today. I'm going to seek you like I seek to know what's going on in everybody else's life on Instagram. I want to see the image of my God and not the image that my friends are posting. I'm thirsty for you, Lord. Let's slip our hands up and just worship and pray. God's doing something in this house today. Guys, this is not the time to, to back off. This is the time to pursue. God, thank you for pastors with a heart for you. Not just a heart for ministry and church, but a heart for you. They know you're the chief shepherd. And they seek you, Lord, in your face, in your face alone. And God, that's why you blessed them these years. Because they won't compromise. They won't give, on, give in to what's, to what's socially correct. They won't give in to what's religiously, politically correct. But God, that they are pursuers of truth and pursuers of you. Now God, honor their cry. Honor their cry, God. Move mightily in the name of Jesus. God, bring forth rivers out of these desperate souls. God, our nation is dry and parched spiritually. But you call these men and women to be rivers, God. Lord, that rivers will erupt from their life. And that God, that everywhere those rivers flow, It'll bring life to their home, their families, their children, their grandchildren, their workplace, their subdivisions, their neighborhoods. God calls the rivers to flow today. Calls rivers to flow that contour the landscape of our nation. Raise up trailblazers. Calls the fire to fall in this house today that burns up everything that's not you. The consuming fire that fills our life that won't let us back up or let up. The fire that is like fire shut up in our bones, God. Fire that empowers, fire that ignites passion. Father, we're hungry today. We're thirsty. We're not going to quit, Lord. Some of you came to this altar today needing a miracle. You're not going to leave disappointed because God is everything His Word says He is. He's a healer. He is a deliverer. He is a restorer. I don't care how far you've run, my friends. You have not run far enough to escape God's love. I don't care what you've done or where you've gone, friends. You have not gone so far that you could escape the power of the blood that he spilled for you on Golgotha's hill. And his love for you never gave up on you when other people did. God's love never gave up on you. He never quit. Today is a day of restoration. Today is a day when we run to the master's arms and he heals and he restores. He sets free and he does what others could have never done for us. He's greater than the power of medicine. He's greater than the power and the influence of people around us. He's greater than the failures and the mistakes that we've made. He's greater than the incarcerating power of an addiction this morning. He's greater. He's greater than the adultery that was committed in your marriage. There is grace for that marriage to be healed, somebody. I speak to that broken marriage today. I speak to that betrayed heart this morning. And I speak healing over that marriage and that home. I speak healing over that broken heart this morning. That that adultery will not destroy your family. That the irreconcilable differences that are happening in your marriage right now are not greater than the influence of God's power. The habits of your husband 
that you feel are destroying your marriage are not greater than God's influence over his life. He needs you to pray for him. He needs you to demonstrate Christ. He needs you to anoint his pillow at night. He doesn't need you to quit and run. He needs you to take a stand and pray. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. My God. Young people, listen to me. Don't you let the world don't you let the world form you. You're created in the image of God. Your friends will be defeated. God's never been defeated. Do you know what that means? You're created in the image of God. You're not created to be defeated. That means that you'll walk through what kills most people. You will walk on top of what drowns everybody else. God called you to be an overcomer. God called you to be a trailblazer. He called you to be a trendsetter. He called you to be the influencer, not the influenced. Father, let the Holy Ghost reign in this house today. Father, fill every man and woman today with the power of the Holy Ghost. We open our hearts and we receive it today in the name of Jesus. We open our hearts today and we receive it in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you that this son, Father, is touched by the master's hands today. You said, Father, where two shall touch and agree. And Father, today we touch and agree. I touch and agree with the many families that are represented in this altar today. I pray for their loved ones. I pray for their children. I pray for their marriages today. And God, we decree and declare the perfect will of God done that no devil will stop it, that no spiritual power will influence it, but God, that your will is done and the glory of the name of Jesus would be manifest in every situation and circumstance. God, I call forth the leaders in this house. God, there's leaders in this house. There's authors in this house. There's songwriters in this house. There's missionaries in this house. There's pastors in this house. There's worshipers in this house, God. Father, there's youth leaders and children's pastors and evangelists in this house. And God, I call forth those gifts today by the authority of Jesus' name. Stir it up today, God. Stir it up in their hearts today that God, that we would not be able to say no any longer, but we will have to say yes to the mandate, the assignment, and the calling upon our lives. Woo. I call it forth in the name of Jesus. Hey, some of you have been running from the call of God on your life. That's why your relationship with God's struggling. I need to give you this prophetic word. Pastor, I want to turn it back over here, but i got to give this prophetic word real quick. I, I want to get out of the way. Let God do what he's doing. There's some of you been running from the call of God on your life. And maybe it's because of insecurities. Maybe it's because you don't feel I have what it takes. Maybe it's because of your past. But it don't matter what your excuse is. You can't get out of this thing. An old timer asked, I asked an old timer one time right after God had called me and I'd surrendered. I said, man, how did you know for sure that you were called? He said, son, if you can get out of it, you ain't called. And see, I had come to that place. I couldn't get out of it. I couldn't run. I couldn't get high enough to escape that call. I couldn't run hard enough. That thing pulled on me in the middle of the night. That thing pulled on me when I woke up in the morning. That call pulled on me when I put my head on the pillow at night. And no matter where I turned or what I did, all I felt was the call of God on my life. I didn't have the education. Nobody in my family has ever been a preacher. We didn't even go to church, much less know what it meant to be in, in ministry. I left a complete football scholarship because I was scared to death of college. I thought if I was going to be a preacher, I had to go to seminary. I can't go back to school. I'm not smart enough. I ran. I like the drugs too much. I like the women too much. I like the alcohol too much. I can't do this. I'll fall and disappoint everybody. But the call was greater than my excuses. And to somebody in this altar today, the call is greater than your excuses. 
And you'll continue to struggle till you say yes. You may not know what it looks like. You may not know what it feels like. But today somebody needs to say, I'm not running anymore. I don't know who in this room has been running. But if you've been running, I want to pray for you today. I can't call you into the ministry. I don't do that. But I just want to pray for you and confirm what God's already telling you. Today I just want to release you. I just want to say, run, brother, run, sister. How many of you in this room have been running from God? I want to know today. I, I, come up here. I want to pray for you. Who else has been running from God? Would y'all come right here? I want to pray for you right here. You've been running from God. You've been running from the Lord. Some of you have been running from salvation. You need to come up here too. Come on. You've been running from God. Come on. Come on. I don't. Boy, I hear the Holy Ghost speaking clearly. Some of you have been running from God. You ain't just been running from a call. You've been running from a call to salvation. And let me tell you something. God will pursue you in the club. <laughs> He'll chase you, get so high, and God will show up in your high. Yes, he will. God will show up in the middle of your high. He'll show up while you got the needle in your arm. And see, church folk won't go to them places, but God will. And some of you been running from him. And you get high and all you talk about is Jesus. You ain't even saying. And you get high and you know God's been after you. <laughs> I feel it. How I many of you been running from God? Come on. I need you to come stand with me up here today. Come on. Come on. Anybody else? You've been running from God. Today the running's over. God wants everything. Woman of God, everything. And when you give him everything today, God's going to give you everything he has. And God's going to do in you what you never could have done on your own. Because see, what God has is without limit. It's without measure. God is greater. God is stronger. God is longer. He, his mercy endures forever. God is, he is more patient. Everything he needs, it is with you. God's not going to give up on you. God is not quitting on you. And God will be there every step of the way. You may have some Red Sea experiences, my sister, but you're going to walk through what other people drowned in. God is going to cause you to go where others have not gone and do what others cannot do because if God is for you woman of God nobody can be against you boy today's a miracle day for you if there's anybody's testimony that's going to ring from this service today loud and clear it's going to be yours because today has been a marked miracle for you. You know it in your heart and your spirit today. Father, I thank you today. She's not going to run no more. God, she's not going to run no more. But today, God, she is throwing her hands up in absolute surrender. That today, God, all that she has is yours. And God, because of that, you're going to fulfill every promise you put in her heart. You're going to do what she struggled to do and couldn't do. And Father, where there's been inabilities and inadequacies, God, that is coming to an end. And what was a struggle yesterday is going to be a victory today. In the name of Jesus. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Woo. I, I, keep, I see Isaiah when I pray for you. God's about to touch your lips with the coals of fire. Father, I thank you today, God, for the touch of fire. Fire that is combustible. It's intense. It's consuming. While at the same time, God, it's liberating. You said your ministers are flames of fire. And Father, I thank you for the igniting of the, of the flame today. That just like you touched Isaiah's lips with that red hot coal. Father, you've touched your daughters tonight this morning with that flame, that fire and God just like you throw a match on gasoline and there is an explosion God I thank you that right now when that red hot coal touches her lips there is an explosion in the name of Jesus yes Lord your yes started when you walked up here when you took that step, 
Mm -hmm. Here I am, Lord. God already started moving. You know, I like the story of the prodigal son, my favorite. While he was yet a great way off, he never made it. He just started in that direction. And God ran to him. Father, thank you that you ran to your daughter today. Because, Lord, when she started toward this altar, when she raised her hand a few seconds ago, Father, she was surrendering and saying, here's my life, God. Here I am. Here's my insecurities. Here's my inadequacies. Here's my excuses, God. All that I have today is yours. Don't let up. Don't back up. Because when you give God all, God's giving you his all. Praise his name. Praise his name. I just feel impressed of the Lord to not close our service this morning, but to continue tonight at six. I just sense that we need to continue in what the Lord is doing in our church. I think He's moving in such a deep way that I want us to have a service tonight at 6 o'clock where we're going to have praise and worship, Tiffany. Uh, we've not even talked, obviously. I just asked Pastor if he could be back. He said, if you need me to, I'll come back tonight. So if our praise team can prep for that. The church will be open at 5 for prayer. Service starts at 6. I just don't want to abort anything that the Lord is wanting to do and trying to do. And I don't want to manufacture anything and make something happen. But I just sense His presence here today that is so sweet and so authentic. It's not been whipped up by man. I think there is a genuine movement of the Spirit today. So what I need as your pastor today... I need you to make this a priority tonight, to be here at 6 o'clock. And I know we got schedules and businesses and works tomorrow and school, get our kids in. But church, how much more to have your kids in an environment like this tonight. We'll have a nursery for our smaller children. So I need to get word back to Miss Pastors Mark and Retta. But I'm going to be here today tonight and whoever shows up we'll we'll have we'll have a meeting with the Lord not church we're gonna have a meeting with the Lord and so I just need my my praise team to be consecrating to think and what the Lord wants but at five we're gonna open up the altars for people to come and pray so everything needs to be done before that you know what I'm saying or what y'all feel do I have anybody that bears witness with me on that today about just being here tonight at six o'clock let's fill the building up Tell people about what God's doing in the house. And uh, get here, bring a friend. Because they're going to be touched just like all of us have been. So we can linger at the altar if you want to. Pray. But at 6 o'clock tonight, we will we'll start our services. Uh, our service. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for using Pastor today. I pray that we will continue to walk softly with you. As you're stepping into this building, we will not manufacture anything. Lord, we want you, and we are thirsty and hungry for you. Save people tonight. Heal and deliver and change us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God is good. Thank you. We will see you.